Ready to go? Great. Yeah. Hey, good afternoon. My name is Stephen Rodriguez, and I am a fellow at New America's International Security Program. And today I'm joined by Scott Hartley, uh, author of the new book, uh, The Fuzzy and the Techie, Why Liberal Arts Will Rule the Digital World. And <clears throat> it's interesting when uh, uh, I, I, Scott and I have known each other for a little while now, and when he first approached me about this, uh, um, I immediately thought of uh, my freshman year in college when I was deciding on what I should major in. And uh, I love history and I love political science, but I, um, I quickly thought, you know, I want to be sure I get a job, you know, coming out of college that doesn't involve academia or, or writing papers that no one, no one cares to read about. So um, I decided to, you know, meet the uh, professional world halfway and, and major in business. Um, <clears throat> but when I read this book and, uh, and I talked to Scott about it, it, it made sense because, you know, my career, like many of yours as well, is you know, taking different pivots and turns. And I, uh, I realized that now what I didn't know then, which is that in many ways, uh, liberal, liberal arts or even business has massive applicability to the uh, technology world, uh, even the innovation in general. Um, so uh, with that, I want to turn it over to Scott. Uh, before uh, Scott kind of tells you more about his book, uh, you know, I know Scott from our time in New York. Uh, he, like, my my, like myself, has spent time in the venture capital world, also worked for Google, Facebook, uh, pretty much has a dream resume, and uh, I think importantly for this book, has uh, spent some time as a presidential innovation fellow, right? Um, so had the, uh, um, the fortune or misfortune of uh, getting some good experience in the government driving and learning about and driving innovation in the uh, large enterprises. So uh, Scott, what, uh, maybe to start, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and why, you have the, uh, uh, why you had the idea to spend a lot of time writing that book. Yeah, well, first of all, uh, thank you to New America and Stephen for having me here today and for all of you guys for spending your lunch uh, with, with, with us here. Um, so my, my sort of impetus for writing the book um, really came out of uh, observation. So I spent my time, I grew up in the Bay Area in sort of the, the boom and the bust of Silicon Valley, um, but it always sort of carried this interest in public policy and in uh, sort of the, fuzzy, the fuzzier side of things. And yet I found my way into Google and then into Facebook and then onto Sand Hill Road uh, where I was working at a venture capital firm. And in the process of VC, your job is effectively to meet with entrepreneurs on a day-to-day -day basis, um, sort of track where you think innovation may be going, and then work with other partners in your firm to place investments in those companies that you think have promise. And the observation I had uh, was sort of at odds with um, the narrative that was coming out of the media and the narrative that I saw on a day-to-day -day basis that basically Silicon Valley was this walled garden, uh, this monolith of techies uh, creating innovation, and there were sort of no uh, other contributors to that world. And I think, you know, if you go back to the 1990s, uh, laying the groundwork and the infrastructure for, for the web and, and, and for the technology that we, that we have today, it may have been more of a true statement that it was kind of pioneered by, by techies. Um, but today, you know, as Mark Andreessen has said uh, and has been sort of uh, propagated throughout the media, you know, software is eating the world. I like to flip that and say, really, you know, software is feeding the world. And it's, it's become the application layer is about how we apply that technology meaningfully. And it's no longer the case that you have to be the techie in order to sort of participate in Silicon Valley. So I was sitting in, in Sand Hill Road and, you know, meeting five meetings a day or so with different entrepreneurs. And I would say at least half of those entrepreneurs were people that were coming out of all these different lives, um, from, from fashion to finance to media to, to defense. Um, you know, they were coming out of different academic backgrounds. They were applying what they had known from sociology or anthropology or economics, um, partnering with a techie often to sort of put the new tools to bear against old problems, things that they, uh, that they understood deeply. But I sort of realized, uh, and the sort of thesis of the book is that as code has become more commoditized, um, the sort of the comparative advantage in how we apply the tech meaningfully often comes from the people that are coming from these other backgrounds, from these other experiences, and have the passion and the, the interest to then apply the technology to, to what they know. Um, so the terms fuzzy and techie, uh, they, they actually come back from the 1960s, 1970s on Stanford campus. Um, and it was this lighthearted uh, association, this sort of lighthearted moniker of, hey, are you, a, are you more of a fuzzy? Are you more of a techie? And really, uh, it was 
just this jocular set of terms, and uh, fuzzies referred to people that studied the arts, the humanities, or the social sciences, and the techies were more self-explanatory people that came out of the engineering world or computer science. And uh, you know, the book also is not about the opposition of these two. It's not that I'm a fuzzy and you're a techie or one or the other. Because really, if you look within sort of uh, any of these programs, if you look within the social sciences, for example, you've got uh, statistical software that you have to master these days. You're often working with big data and data sets. Um, you're, you know, you're engaging with independent and dependent variables. And you know, if you're doing uh, deterrence, uh, you're, you're working with game theory and things like that. Um, so they're not, you know, the fuzzy subjects are not uniformly fuzzy. And then you go to the techie side and you look at mechanical engineering these days and you've got the, the advent of design thinking, which is basically user psychology. There's a lot about user experience design and, and about sort of know your customer, uh, customer experience interviews, which are kind of sociological or even anthropological in how they work. Um, so you start kind of peeling back these terms and you realize actually, you know, we're all a bit of both and it's about the confluence of these, of these two things. Um, and, you know, the, the sort of secondary part of the book, which uh, refers to, you know, how the liberal arts were, will rule the digital world, you know, this sort of takes this concept of liberal arts that I think has been, to some degree, thrown under the bus. Uh, in Silicon Valley, for example, uh, you know, Mark Andreessen has, has said uh, that those with soft skills will work in shoe stores. Uh, I have nothing against shoe stores, but I don't think that's true. I don't think that you know, English majors will necessarily be baristas, uh, or like Vinod Kosla, one of the founders of, of Sun Microsystems, has said, um, you know, basically the liberal arts have no value in the future economy. And uh, first of all, I mean, the, if we look at the kind of classic definition of what the liberal arts are, they incorporate mathematics, they incorporate logic, they incorporate the natural sciences. So you know, if we look at some of the most emergent fields in, in the venture capital world, for example, um, CRISPR and sort of gene sequencing, and, you know, these are things that come out of the natural sciences. These are things that come out of the study of biology without you know, direct vocational application, but the exploration, the curiosity, the passion, kind of tugging on the mind. Um, and those are sort of the premises um, of the liberal arts that I, that I mean when I say you know, these, are, these are the things that will rule the digital world. Um, so that's, that's sort of the... Uh, I guess, the rationale behind uh, why I wrote the book and, and sort of the, the overarching thesis. Great. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so if you, if you listen to podcasts or, you know, check websites or, or watch, uh, you know, any of the, the major news networks, you would feel that we're in, in a world, um, if it's not consumed by software, it's consumed by AI and automation, right? That's, these are big economic messages today about, you know, where people, um, including the administration, are talking about the role of automation and taking jobs away or bringing jobs here. Um, <clears throat> so kind of piggybacking off of uh, the comments you just made, how, you know, how or why should a world that's consumed in you know, artificial intelligence and automated uh, uh, processes uh, even care about liberal arts uh, you know, and, and, and things related to anthropology or history or you know, political science? Yeah, so I mean, the looking kind of empirically across the valley, um, and when I say Silicon Valley, I don't mean the geographic location. I mean kind of writ large, this uh, the tech, tech, technological layer, because you know as we're seeing at 1776 down the street here mm -hmm. in D.C., you know as we're seeing in places like Lexington, Kentucky, and Chattanooga, and uh, you know a number of Denver, Colorado, a bunch of places in between, really. Uh, the access to information has, in the sort of dem democratization of a lot of these tools, has really, uh, in, not to mention the, the application layer of these technologies, has meant that we've got sort of a much more broadening of, of where technology exists. Um, but so the reason, the reason I think that it still matters, um, if you look, so in 2014, uh, Oxford came out with a study that said 47% of uh, US jobs were at high risk of machine automation. And this was sort of the, the rise of the robots and Martin Ford's book and uh, thinking about, you know, the, the reality that there were so many jobs that were at risk. Mm -hmm. um, in January of this year, McKinsey Global Institute came out with a kind of a follow-on study where they looked uh, at a little more granular level and they said, you know, wait a minute, let's, let's look at 800 occupations. Let's look at what's comprised of those occupations because all of our jobs consist of many, many tasks. And if we divvy up occupations by tasks, and then we, we, we attempt to match tasks with uh, basically what machines can currently do and what we project them to be able to do down the road, we actually find that 
they found that 5% of jobs, which is still a non-trivial number, 5% has massive implications for all sorts of social reasons and you know, questions of basic income and questions that, that are uh, commonly you know, brought to the <coughs> forefront of the media, um, but it's not 47%. And what they also found was that for 60% of jobs, 30% of the tasks within those jobs were things that would change generally over an eight to 20 plus year time frame. So I think the, the reality that we're living in is much less about you know, this coming uh, wave of, of full automation and, and sort of serial automation and, and AI taking over jobs. And it's much more about if you flip the letters from artificial intelligence, AI, to intelligence augmentation, IA, you know, that's something to really think about. Um, in, in the automotive world, you know, we look at self-driving cars and, and we think, okay, you know, over what period of time are all of our vehicles just going to be humming around the, the roads by themselves? And we've, we've been undergoing this process for a long time, you know, all the way back to uh, manual to automatic transmission, to park assist, to anti-lock brakes. Um, you know, we're starting to see the, the, the benefits of lane guidance and, you know, being on a freeway in a particular area with no potholes and good visibility, we'll start seeing, you know, autonomous vehicles uh, more and more. Um, but, you know, it's not going to happen overnight. And I think if you look at uh, that sort of progression, it's much more serial progression than it is sort of all, all or none. Um, and, uh, and I think the same is true in our workforce. So if you look at, you know, driver assist, for example, in the car, we're much more likely, I think, to have desktop assist in the office than we are to have, you know, uh, robots taking our, our job, you know, whole hog. And, uh, and so that, you know, one of the interesting things in, in, in the book is if you, if you actually unpack this idea and say, you know, where are, the, where are the tasks within our jobs that can be taken away? Generally, you know, a best practice that we have be, could become a machine practice. And what I mean by that is if you have a best practice, it's generally something that you've done before, you know, you know the process, right. it can be scripted. If it can be scripted, it can be programmed. And if it can be programmed, obviously, there's a machine that can do that. And so if you look within any job and you say, okay, what are the best practices, the scripted tasks, those are generally the simple things. And those are the things that are highly routine and those can be sort of moved away to machines. But what that does is it frees up the human in that role to then uh, focus on the complex tasks. And if you focus on the complex tasks, one of the guys that I interview and, and talk with um, is a guy named David Deming who's up at the, the Harvard uh, Graduate School of Education. And David Deming talks about the uh, basically social skills and soft skills as being this dark matter in the educational world and this dark matter in the, in the uh, employment world of, uh, you know, it's something that we can't really quantify. We know it's important, but how do we, how do we really uh, put our finger on it? It's kind of like dark matter in the universe. We know that it's out there, but we can't quite put our finger on what it is. And um, what he talks about is in this world where all the simple tasks are scripted and eroded by machines, and what's left are the complex tasks, we actually specialize more. So you may be good at one thing, I'm good at something else. And we start task trading more frequently. And in that process of task trading, we actually uh, encounter friction. And in that sort of, there's a transaction cost associated with that task trading. And what reduces that <coughs> transaction cost, what reduces the friction, is actually uh, soft skills, social skills, things that you, know, you learn through uh, tugging on the mind, uh, being collaborative, being empathetic mm -hmm. to another's position. And I think it's a really interesting um, sort of second deck maybe to this whole wave of AI and wave of automation is to say, you know, if these things do start, uh, for example, in the legal space, um, Dana Remus and Frank Levy uh, ran a study that I talk about in the book where they said, let's look at legal and let's figure out, you know, in the legal profession, where are the scripted tasks and what can we take away? And they found 13% of legal uh, tasks could be, could be scripted and taken away. But that doesn't mean that 13% of lawyers disappear. It means within each job, you know, there's sort of a small subset of tasks like reading a 500-page contract for, you know, capital letters or not capital letters. You know, that sort of thing we can obviously outsource to machines. And, um, you know, really I think it gives some of these new scale advantages, the same way that Amazon Web Services, AWS, um, has empowered you know, smaller startups to have the same scale efficiencies as big companies. I think the same way you know, with automation and AI, we'll start seeing you know, a small law firm maybe able to compete with a big law firm because they've got the same tools as having 50 associates. Um, so you know, those are some of the ideas I think around uh, the reason why uh, you know, increasingly I think this training in uh, liberal arts or training in 
um, ways to train collaboration, ways to train communication, empathy, some of the soft skills, the dark matter. Um, th those become you know, really important in this, in this sort of machine-led world. Well, I can definitely tell you, uh, you know, I would personally pay a lot of money uh, you know, for whatever dark matter helped me uh, you know, read uh, government contracting language uh, <laughs> faster. Uh, that's, uh, that would be a valuable skill. It's interesting you mentioned uh, um, AI and automation because um, <clears throat> you know, I, I think pivoting more to or, towards you know, the field I'm in now, international security, you know, I've often thought about you know, unmanned systems, right? You know, uh, Predator or the Reaper or Global Hawk or these, these kind of you know, Terminator-like you know, unmanned tanks that are going to go out and wipe everyone out. And um, <clears throat> I had a conversation with someone recently, and they reminded me that for, I think it's every one or two um, Predators, you know, these unmanned, unmanned uh, planes that have, uh, you know, we use for uh, combat and non-combat missions overseas primarily, uh, I think they said uh, up to 80 people are required to keep those things in the air. So, you know, maybe, you know, by having a predator in the air, certain individuals no longer are able to or have the job that they did, but now there's this whole new set of job skills that I, I might add the Air Force is, is um, massively undermanned and filling right now uh, to keep, keep these, you know, these unmanned systems, which are actually, you know, maybe the word isn't unmanned, and maybe it's almost overmanned. Uh, <laughs> there's no one's on the plane itself. Um, so I think on, related to international security and even you know, Washington, D.C., uh, um, who in the government today, whether individuals or, or agencies, you know, gets this paradigm, in your opinion? I mean, you spent time as a, as a PIF, right, the Presidential Innovation Fellow. You know, have you run into people um, here in Washington uh, that, that seem to understand this? Yes, we, we were talking before, and I think it's an interesting concept of, um, so when Todd Park, uh, working with President Obama, uh, he was the second CTO for President Obama, he uh, brought this pro program into to fruition that was the Presidential Innovation Fellows Program. And what it, the attempt was, was to bring technologists from outside of Washington into the Beltway to bring sort of outside perspective, tech perspective, uh, some ability to bring uh, you know, design and, and some product innovation and, and things to different agencies and to really come in and uh, sort of like the White House Fellows Program, be kind of tacked along with a CTO within a various agency, within a particular agency and you know, work to make that agency a little bit more efficient or think about some of these outside tools they could apply, um, focused on you know, data, um, data visualization or making, uh, digitizing uh, physical sure. records like in, uh, in uh, different, uh, the National Archives, for example. Um, so that was an example, I think, of importing techies in some ways. And we were chatting about earlier um, this idea of uh, whether it's exporting fuzzies, uh, exporting, uh, I think it's more exporting problem sets and understanding uh, depth of understanding of problems, particular problems, mm -hmm. from places like Washington, where you know we have a finger on the pulse for um, maybe coming uh, legislation, coming regulation, um, data that's uh, walled up in sort of government agencies that can be uh, made made open and accessible um, through application programming interfaces, APIs, where developers can then pipe that data into new tools. Um, you know, those, those are ways that I think we can start, quote unquote, maybe exporting the fuzzy as, as we have kind of imported the techie. Um, I think that a really great example of this um, was uh, prior Secretary of Defense, Ash Carter, in bringing um, the defense industry out to Silicon Valley. So rather than trying to, you know, through DARPA and through many programs, um, we've always tried to bring technologists into Washington. But I thought his uh, attempt to bring DOD and defense out to Silicon Valley was, was interesting. And through the process of creating, um, it's called DIUX, and it's the defense um, innovation sort of experimental um, incubator that's out in Silicon Valley in Moffett Field, they've, uh, they've started creating all sorts of programs uh, really exporting problem sets. So exporting understanding of uh, particular needs that the defense industry, the security industry has. Um, and one of, the, one of the sort of outgrowths of that is uh, the partnership between uh, Steve Blank, who's an entrepreneurship professor, um, pioneer of kind of the lean startup method. He was actually the professor for Eric Ries, who wrote the book Lean Startup. 
Um, and so Steve Blink is, is really sort of the pioneer of this build, measure, learn mentality. Mm -hmm. And uh, working with uh, two former Army colonels, uh, Steve Blink uh, started a program, it's called Hacking for Defense, and then there's now a second one called Hacking for Diplomacy. And they're basically courses that have now rolled out to, I think, around 13 different colleges. Right. Uh, you mentioned Texas, mm -hmm. Texas A&M, um, JMU here in Virginia um, has, has this program as well. Um, but basically, what this does is it takes problem sets from to, to particular agencies or uh, particular uh, teams within the military. Uh, for example, Navy divers needing to have uh, better information about biometric data. And it pairs that problem with a team that's mixed between com computer scientists, electrical engineers, people from techie fields, and uh, PhDs in political science, people studying uh, international relations. And these composite teams uh, work together for a 10-week quarter on whatever problem they're assigned to. And the innovations have been really, uh, really amazing uh, in sort of these short sprints uh, by exporting the problems and getting sort of crowdsourcing, if you will, uh, different perspectives on how we can fix them. Um, I think that's one idea that, that really kind of gets to the heart of, of the book, not just about kind of bringing you know, techies into Washington, but I think taking some of the, the things that we really understand here um, and, and sort of exporting them as well. Um, I could, there's another, another example of uh, you know, coming regulation. Uh, if you think about where, as, uh, you know, as an innovator, as somebody uh, sitting uh, trying to build a company, if you have the information about where the world is changing, so much of in the venture capital seat, it's not just the problem and the solution that you have, but it's the timing. It's why now? Why is it important today? Because if you're right at the wrong time, you're wrong, right? And so I think one of the big things that Washington could help with is helping entrepreneurs and helping people understand the timing of particular things. So if there's coming regulation, for example, in trucking, I know uh, later this year there is a mandatory electronic logging device that becomes uh, mandated where 31 million trucks on the road, uh, suddenly you've got to have logging information that's not just paper notes you know, kept in a spiral notebook uh, when you're sleeping, when you're driving, there's you know, regulation for safety on when you can drive and how many hours a day. Um, now there's, uh, there's this mandate of you know, needing to have an electronic logging device and there's a company out in Silicon Valley uh, called Keep Trucking. It's founded by uh, uh, a Pakistani American from Texas who studied political science at London School of Economics. And his family back in Pakistan knew the trucking industry. He said, I'm going to leave my cushy job at Kosala Ventures working for Vinod Kosala. Case in point, here's a liberal arts guy who worked for Vinod and then went and started a company that's, that's doing very well. Um, so Shoaib left the company and he founded Keep Trucking and what they do is they've created uh, an IoT device, so Internet of Things device that attaches to the engine and it provides that real time, time information about uh, you know, when the truck is running, what the RPMs are on the engine, so if the truck is loaded or not loaded. And they're starting to cultivate all this data around you know, which lanes uh, for you know, real time shipping information across the US. Mm -hmm. You know, which uh, trucking lanes are, are highly optimized, which ones are deadheads <coughs> where a trucker is driving one way loaded and they're driving home uh, unloaded mm -hmm. with, with, with no, uh, no shipment. And so, you know, those are the kind of things where if you have information on changing legislation, changing regulation, um, they can be really uh, big drivers of innovation. It's interesting because uh, I've had a number of friends here in D.C. Who've, who've gone out to you know, to work for a technology firm mm -hmm. or um, a venture capital firm. And inevitably, uh, um, they've, they've gone into what we call kind of GR positions, like government relations mm -hmm. uh, positions, where they're essentially the in-house the in lobbying you know, person for that firm, whether it's Uber or you mentioned in injuries in Horowitz, you know, places like this. Um, <clears throat> and that's always, that's kind of bothered me uh, only because, I, you know, to your point, I thought, well, shoot, you know, there's got to be there's got to be a lot more value that someone who's spent time here in D.C. Mm -hmm. not not just you know reading the reading the tea leaves on Capitol Hill, but really understanding how government works. Mm -hmm. There's got to be like real business value, not just um, being a, a, a congressional advisor or a, you know a lobbyist. Um, there's got to be real value on the business side that uh, these men and women can bring to, the, to these firms. And I think you kind of touched on some of these people here in this book. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I think rather not just subject matter. It's not the applicability of the subject matter. It's sort of the applicability of the methodology. And so, I mean, one example, if you look at uh, the people, and this is, again, one of the observations, kind of one of the empirical truths that I thought was there that was against the grain of this narrative in, in the media and in the Valley about tech being this sort of monolithic place of techies, is if you look at uh, you know, Sheryl Sandberg, economics major, you look at Susan Wojcicki, who runs <coughs> YouTube, uh, history and literature major. Uh, Steve Case, here in DC, founded AOL, history major from Williams College. Uh, you know, you look at um, Alex Karp, who runs Palantir, big data company. He has a PhD in neoclassical social theory. Um, Peter Thiel, who loves to hate on liberal arts, philosophy degree, law degree. Um, so you kind of go, go down the route, and it's, uh, there's a lot more people than you would expect um, that have these sort of irrelevant degrees. Uh, Pinterest, if anyone likes Pinterest. Uh, ben Silverman was a political science major mm -hmm. at Yale. Um, Thumbtack, political science, again. Um, so there, there are all these examples, and uh, Stuart Butterfield is the founder of Slack, and Slack is a new uh, corporate communications platform that's trying to become the sort of alternative to email. It's a little bit uh, you know, more efficient, or you can, you can tag people's names, uh, kind of like Twitter. You can have attribution of, of subjects and, and people. And um, Stuart Butterfield, actually, well, he was the creator of Flickr, which was a photo sharing app back in the day. Um, but, but really, before that, he was a philosopher. And he did both his undergrad and his grad studies in Canada in philosophy. And in the process of creating Slack, you know, we often look at these companies and we say, Man, you know, if only I had the foresight to build that five years ago. But you realize in the lean startup kind of methodology, people they don't have the foresight. They just start doing something and they start iterating their way toward yeah. what becomes a truer and truer version of, of what works. <coughs> and so uh, Slack started as a gaming company and it was called Tiny Spec. And <laughs> in the process of building this gaming company, um, they used an internal communications tool. They built it um, to communicate with between the engineers, and that over time they realized maybe this has more value than the gaming company and they started iterating toward that and that became Slack. In the process of doing that, uh, Stuart Butterfield attributes that process to this, uh, this methodology of philosophy and the sort of philosophical inquiry, if you think about, you know, you sit at a, at a Harkness table, a round table and you debate ideas and you try to uh, not judge people based on their positions but you know, iteratively get toward this idea of truth or as the closest approximation you can get. And that's, in many ways, the same as a product development process. You know, how do you huh. get um, closer and closer to what product market fit is, whatever that is? Um, well, you've got to, you know, iterate your way toward that. And it's yeah. very similar in some ways to that process. And so, you know, there's so many examples of uh, the methodologies, I think, that, are, that, are, that come to play within the product development process um, at a place like Google, um, at um, you know, at, at all these companies. That reminds me of <clears throat> a conversation I had one time. I uh, met with a, uh, a very, very senior executive at a, a, a household name technology firm that will go uh, nameless for this conversation. And uh, this person, you know, in proclaiming the, uh, the, the wonders of, uh, of, of their company said, well, we, we only hire people who know how to code. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. I said, well, I learned the code in the 90s. I, you know, I learned Pascal uh, via you know, VHS tape in, in growing up <laughs> in Europe. Uh, so does that count? And, he, and uh, this person said, well, no, no, it's got to be you know, current language. I said, great. Do you know how to code? Well, no. Uh, <clears throat> I was like, it, it, it's exactly to your point. I, I was scratching my head saying, well, look, you're, you're a key driver of value and, and of presumably revenue uh, for this, uh, this major technology firm, and you're a, you know, you're a, you're a, a fuzzy. Yep. Um, uh, well, what's, what's interesting is even, um, so as the tools have become more democratized to learn the new techie tools, I think if you look back to uh, the 90s and, and well before that, um, the syntax you had to master to be a techie uh, was really, it was close to the metal, it was highly complex syntax. As we've gotten farther and farther away, you know, more and more abstractions away from that, um, it's moving toward natural language processing. We're not there yet, but I think the sort of ultimate level would be English, like we have with Alexa or we have with Siri. You know, if those things actually worked well, um, we would be able to command, uh, command access to our data. But the big bottleneck is the ability to ask the question, not the ability to have the data. And so, um, 
you know, I think Voltaire, if you go all the way back, yeah. um, Voltaire has a great quote of uh, paraphrase that was, you know, judge a man or a woman by, uh, by their questions, not by their answers. And I think mm. increasingly, you know, if we want an answer, we'll ask a machine. And if we want a question, we're going to have to ask a smart, a smart human. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, those are, those are some of the things that, uh, that I think, you know, as these tools have become uh, more and more democratized, um, you know, back to, your, back to your point, you know, even when they're building the, these tools like Codecademy, for example, I don't know okay. if anyone knows Codecademy, but they've got 25 million plus people learning to code um, through these online, uh, online dashboards where you actually uh, you follow directions and you, and you put code into the, into the developer environment. And uh, in the process of building Codecademy, uh, Zach Sims, who founded the company, who is a dropout from Columbia, uh, also a political science major, um, I have to give a couple shouts out to, I'm a political science guy myself. Um, Zach Sims, he was looking at hiring you know, top coders, top people out of uh, different programs at Caltech and MIT and, and all these schools, and people coming out of CS programs. And he said, you know, here are the languages that I need to build Codecademy. And none of them had the requisite uh, coding language skills. They had theoretical uh, great grounding in C++ and things that uh, you know, taught them the building blocks, but they still had to go to general assembly. They still had to go uh, upskill in some of the latest languages. They had to learn Ruby on Rails. They had to go to a, a coding workshop at night. Um, so I think the concept that you know, we can graduate with any slip of paper, whether it's a STEM slip of paper or it's a political science slip of, slip of paper, um, and have that be this sort of carte blanche to relevance in this future economy, I think those days are numbered. Um, and it's much more about uh, keeping our education in beta, um, keeping our education a work in progress. And uh, you know, I think that's something else, you know, myth busting in the book, that I think there's then this narrative today that if you're techie, if you study STEM, you still have this carte blanche, uh, you've got this key to relevance in the future world. And this is a changing target, you know, on a monthly basis or a yearly basis. The, the coding languages and things, the tools change. And so really it's about the ability to, you know, be a smart questioner, right. not, just, not just have the answers. Yeah, that reminds me of a, an old uh, anecdote I heard that said that um, uh, getting an, uh, going to undergrad, right, getting a, a bachelor's degree uh, teaches you um, how to learn. And then getting a, a um, postgraduate degree teaches you uh, what to learn. Um, and it's this idea of, I, I like what you said about uh, education and beta, or mm -hmm. continually learning. And I think, um, <clears throat> actually, I'd be interested in getting your thoughts on this, too. You, know, you have these new, uh, oddly enough, primarily technology-related uh, trade classes or trade schools, like General Assembly um, or Code Academy, uh, even, you know, to, in a different degree, Khan Academy, which mm -hmm. is designed to kind of quickly and, you know, relatively easily help people who, who want to learn. Uh, Help them, you know, help them learn how to learn you know, specific uh, subject matters without having to go and spend, um, <clears throat> you know, fifty, a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars for a, um, you know, a master's or a master's plus level class, um, and and I think you know, uh, that that's become of personal interest to me, as, especially in, in international security, where, you know, a lot of times, you know, my fear is people. Don't ask the hard questions because the answers are going to be really ugly. You know, they. Um, I, I got my. Uh, I, I re reverted to my true form and went to uh, Georgetown to get my master's in uh, foreign service. And uh, um, one of the first things they taught us was, uh, you know, policy making is about um, choosing the least bad option. And um, a lot of times, you know, those the you know in order to even get to those options, uh, you have to ask very hard questions or even the questions that. You know your boss uh, or your peers aren't necessarily going to know how to deal with, mm -hmm. or have a great response to that. Um, you know, in that in that meeting there. But I think answering these questions, you know, maybe going back to the Socratic method. Um, yeah, I think could be good. The, um, you know, the the narrative in the media has been, uh, and it, for good reason. I think you know, if you look at sort of triple threat um, of 2008 financial crisis and rising unemployment. Um, you know, the, the co rising cost of student debt and the importance of that. Um, and then sort of this coming wave of automation, the fears around uh, technological transformation and job loss. You know, it's been this sort of triple threat against, uh, you know, qu these questions of, of what is the purpose of education? You know, is it all about vocational relevance? There is a near-term uh, million job 
gap in STEM. So there right. is a very real need for, for technical literacy. Um, the book's not against technical literacy. I think it's, it's bust, myth busting this idea that um, they're mutually exclusive, that you know, you study philosophy, uh, you, you know nothing about coding. Well, you know, if you read James Joyce, you should probably learn a little JavaScript, <laughs> you know? It's about kind of blending these, these two sides. And um, in, it goes back to actually 1959 and, and well before that, but um, Charles Percy Snow, C.P. Snow, um, he gave what was called the Reed Lecture at Cambridge University in the UK. And uh, it was dubbed the Two Cultures Lecture because he talked about this sort of opposition of two cultures, of the sciences and the humanities. And he basically said, you know, if we have uh, people learning the laws of thermodynamics, they should also be reading Shakespeare and vice versa. And, uh, and so it's not a new idea, you know, to kind of blend these two. But I think that in the advent of, um, you know, big data and AI and all these buzzwords that we see on a day-to-day -day basis, there's been this notion that um, these are magic uh, new secret sauces that are going to change our world. And somehow with enough data, the answers are going to appear. And with AI, you know, our jobs are going to disappear. And in actuality, you know, going back to Plato and Sir Francis Bacon and like information not being the same thing as knowledge and the transition between information and knowledge requires sort of human input. And, uh, you know, to go back to defense, I mean, there are a couple examples in the book. You think um, in this world of uh, big data, you know, if you go up to Newport, Rhode Island to the Naval War College, why do we still have uh, war gaming? You know, if we have all the data and we've got all the signals intelligence, why the heck do we do war gaming? Well, of course, there's a human component. And you've got you've to have force on force adversarial <coughs> games. You've got to have, uh, you know, see what happens and see what doesn't happen and why. And uh, thinking about, you know, red teaming and all these different ideas. Um, and there's a phenomenal logical uh, experiential component to that. Um, that is the reason why we still, even in this big data world, we still do wargaming. Or, you know, uh, in the South China Sea, you've got all these, uh, you know, signals intelligence on, on ships, but you, you hear about, you know, snafus where an oil rig is moved to uh, different waters and there's a, you know, a bunch of uh, ships surrounding it. And there's this moment of crisis where you have to think, is this uh, an exercise? Is this an attack? Is this something bigger? And it's the context in addition to the code. Mm -hmm. It's the... It's the human perspective, like you said, you know, to keep a, a drone in the air takes 80, uh, 80 engineers or so. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's the sort of reality behind the curtain of these uh, buzzwords of AI and, and, and machine learning. And, uh, you know, and so those are, those are some of the examples. Um, yeah. So uh, <clears throat> uh, last, last quick question, and then uh, pl please uh, uh, queue up your own questions with the remaining time we have. Um, it's interesting you mentioned wargaming. That's uh, I, I got my start in mm -hmm. uh, wargaming for the primarily the intelligence community, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, the one w one war game I missed because I was literally at another war game was the the infamous uh, Millennium Challenge war game two thousand three, where they had a, a Marine general uh, named uh, Paul Van Riper, and <clears throat> they were uh, uh, um, gaming out a, a, a scenario in in the Persian Gulf. It was a, a naval scenario, and. Uh, General Van Riper was the uh, uh, commander of the Red Team, the uh, opposing forces uh, that were going against, you know, the, the you know, various blue teams that were commanded by these various uh, uh, senior military officers, and they, they had their own staffs, and they're executing this war game, basically saying, what if we did these certain operations? What would the enemy do? And uh, to your point, uh, I think a big data, a big data um, uh, scenario may, or who knows, maybe maybe it would have picked this up, but. Um, if you had just done a, a Monte Carlo uh, simulation, mm -hmm. um, maybe it would have said, "Hey, these uh, these massive U.S. Navy ships, you know, crush the uh, the uh, um, opposing force uh, mm -hmm. ten times out of ten. Well, General General Van Riper uh, said, um, "Why don't I get a whole bunch of small, like fast attack boats, like little little boats and dinghies, and and swarm this carrier battle group sitting in the uh, the Persian Gulf?" And they ended up sinking the entire fleet. Uh, and and it, the only reason we know about it is because the uh, the U.S. Navy uh, said, well, we can't we can't have that outcome, and so they refloated the um, the sunk Navy U.S. Navy fleet. <clears throat> General Van Riper said this is completely ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Speaking of asking hard questions, and walked out of the war game, and then you know, this this whole scenario promptly got leaked to I think the Wall Street Journal. Um, <laughs> 
which, which of course, you know, leave it to the media to ask, ask the hard questions for us. Um, so I guess the, the final, final question, and I'll turn it over to you, the audience, uh, is, <clears throat> you know, you know, I would imagine, I've certainly not written a book, but when I, when I sit down to write an article or a paper, I often start with a question, like what question am I trying to ask? You know, the question that you uh, presumably asked yourself when you were looking to write this book, um, how did that change, or what was the initial question you did ask yourself, and, and is that different than what the, uh, you know, kind of ended up in the final product? That's a great question. Um, of course, yeah, and so my, my lens on the book is my sort of reality com from coming from Silicon Valley and, and Sand Hill Road and, and that world in the world of startups and seeing, like I talked about, tiny spec iterating its way over to become Slack. The same way is true with all productions uh, like a book. Um, so the, I think the original thesis was, if I think back to one of my earliest drafts, which was a few years back at this point, um, it was that you don't have to be technical to succeed in Silicon Valley. That was sort of the original. The title was always the same because I loved the framing. Uh, yeah, it's a good title. Uh, and uh, and I, so I, I, I kind of knew the title from the moment that I, I thought about it. But the second deck um, was originally, uh, you know, why you can be non-technical in the tech world and, and, and still succeed. And, uh, and then kind of as we got into that, we said, well, what, what embodies that? Well, that's really more like the liberal arts. And then, you know, as uh, other great books have come out, um, like Kathy O'Neill had a book called uh, uh, Weapons of Math Destruction. And it's a fantastic read if you haven't read it. Um, but it's about, uh, you know, the sort of uh, being an AI realist or being a realist about big data and saying, you know, if you, if you, if you look at, um, you know, big data is one thing, but how we collect it is another thing, uh, where it comes from. So, if you think about uh, predictive policing, we think of, you know, can we deploy our police forces in more optimized ways? Well, probably technology can help, but then if you kind of look at, well, what's the source of the data that informs where we send the police? Is there some bias in the reporting of that data? You know, is that data, is, it's based on crime data that's reported. Well, is all crime data in there? No, because it's reported crime data. Um, you know, so is there bias in maybe when and where and how certain types of crimes are reported? Some are underreported chronically. Um, so if you start running these algorithms that extrapolate and propagate that, um, you can get to uh, really kind of binary outcomes. And so, you know, it's about kind of asking the questions of bias behind big data, um, you know, realizing the fallibility of all these tools. Um, so if you code something into ones and zeros and, and, and call it an algorithm, you know, it doesn't become any more inherently objective than humans sitting in a room. Um, the, the people creating these things are engineers uh, in Silicon Valley or, or wherever they might be mm -hmm. um, with very real uh, biases and, you know, questions and, 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 and human fallibility. And so I think kind of taking a step back and just uh, recognizing the, those, those truths kind of behind uh, the buzzwords. Got it. Um, so... Uh, I'm not sure if we have a microphone. Uh, great, thank you. Um, so if you have a question, uh, please raise your hand. Um, uh, introduce yourself. And uh, uh, please limit your uh, question to the form of a question. So uh, right up here first, please. <coughs> Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Michael Kurtzig, retired from the US Agriculture. You talked about education, about jobs. Our leader across the street over here is keeps on talking about jobs, bringing jobs back, and also economic growth as we head into a financial crisis is beyond imagination, apparently, if we don't get the economy moving, from what I understand. You talked a little bit about education. Maybe I missed some of it, but are we prepared to meet, uh, are we educating in such a way as we're meeting what, what is the next generation needs, maybe more in techies than fuzzy, I mean fuzzy, as you said, comes out in different places, but techie is very important. And the second part of that is what, what you said, how does that apply to the globe, to the rest of the world, where jobs are very difficult to find, where huge unemployment, whether it's in Egypt or Iran or China, I know, where there's also, but you don't see it, or in France. Mm -hmm. So can you speak to that a little bit? Sure. Thank you. Um, thank you for your question. Um, so the 
you know, the status quo, obviously, we've got to recognize the changing landscape, the changing uh, world around us where technical literacy is hugely important. So I think there is a way to kind of, uh, to, again, back to this point that these are not mutually exclusive things that we can have them both. We have to ask ourselves, well, how can we teach this in a way that engages new technology but doesn't lose the, the old uh, framing and, and lose like the, 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 the gravitas and the context and all these things? And so one way is if we take uh, maybe old subjects and we apply them through the lens of these modern technologies. So in the case of um, ethics or philosophy, you know, we can read Kant, we can read John Stuart Mill, but what if we can read it and then apply it to this modern uh, context of self-driving cars, all right? So we have a, a car pulling into an intersection um, and we have, you know, various, uh, you know, various moments where there are questions about uh, ethics and how if you were building the machine learning or you know to, to go left or go right uh, fill up a foot in the sort of trolley problem that's uh, people talk about if you have a trolley on a on a track and you've got to choose the left track or the right track and there's imminent death on both tracks how do you make that choice um, these are kind of unanswerable phil philosophy questions that could be paired with you know reading of uh, different ethical paradigms and you know so you could be thinking through uh, some of the classical texts but in a modern way um, similarly, you know, uh, using this sort of Socratic method to teach things. Um, they're looking at K through 12. Uh, I think one of the interesting uh, studies that I, I tried to bring into the book was grappling with messy problems, and messy problems being in this era of Google, where we can Google anything and find the answer in moments, right? Um, what's the point of learning if you can just mm -hmm. Google anything? Well. Of course, you can't Google everything. And so if you have these messy questions, which one example of that, um, it was a school, I can't recall where, I think it was in Kentucky, where they, uh, the teacher asked, you know, what if we had square ears? And this was a question she posed to you know, a classroom of fifth graders. And they had to use all these tools. They had to use iPads and Google and, and watching YouTube videos and all these different things. But there was no right answer. And so they had to learn about acoustics, they had to learn about physiology, biology, they had to actually inquire against sources and say, you know, I trust that source, I don't trust this other one, this video looks a little sketchy. Um, and so they had to sort of grapple with these same challenges that we have on a daily basis when, you know, we've got red newsfeed or blue newsfeed in our Facebook, um, kind of depending on what our friends share. And so we have to grapple with sources and things like right. that. So I think to the extent that we can, um, you know, teach these things, but engaging the new tools, not, you know, being a Luddite and saying, you know, out with any new tool, technical literacy is not relevant. Um, of course it is. And so we've got to, you know, engage these things meaningfully. But I like that idea of messy questions uh, and how can we sort of teach through some of that. Yeah, that reminds me of, uh, <coughs> that, that certainly reminds me of, um, you know, in research, you know, one of the challenges you have is, is uh, learning what question what you what what question you should even be asking to begin mm -hmm. with, and I think Google you know, starts with that premise that you actually know the question you're supposed to be you're supposed to be asking, right? Um, I, I have a uh, I have a, a 20 month old and a, a three week old at home right now, um, and I think with both of them you see their personalities come out early on, and I think the one thing I really hope for them is that they would always um, uh, they would always you know you know, keep asking those questions, uh, you know, just not at, you know, 8 o'clock when I'm trying to put them down, <laughs> down for bed. Uh, I think we had a question in the back. Was that right? Right there on the blue blazer. Right, thanks a lot. Uh, Jeff Alexander with the uh, Research Triangle Institute. So I'm really interested in uh, an area I study, which is uh, interdisciplinarity, right? So there is this zone right in the middle of Fuzzy and Techie, yeah. and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about, like, do you see, I mean, there are now majors that are, just designed to be inherently interdisciplinary, right? You have people majoring in, say, computational sociology or science and technology and society or things like that. Like, do you see those interdisciplinary majors also playing kind of a, an important role in how all of this plays out in the workplace? Definitely. Um, so, yeah, I talk a little bit about STEAM education, obviously STEM with the A for arts uh, mixed in there. Um, I, I love these uh, interdisciplinary majors. I, I feel like I see more ads in The Economist and places for different programs uh, here at you know, Georgetown and sort of applied intelligence and you know, using data science but applied to a particular field, for example. 
Um, there's one that I, I talk about in the book that's called Symbolic Systems, only because there have been some incredible um, graduates of that program, like Reed Hoffman, who founded LinkedIn, Marissa Mayer, uh, Mike Krieger, who founded Instagram, um, I'm figuring, Scott Forstall, who invented iOS effectively. And so you look within a lot of these tech companies, and a lot of these people are symbolic systems majors. Mm -hmm. And what that major comprises is uh, logic, philosophy, math, computer science, um, and psychology. So pretty much the hardest major you could possibly It's think. the hardest, yeah. I looked at the major, and then I quickly ran away from it. <laughs> Sounds like a terrible idea. Um, but you know, it's an incredible uh, cross-section, because you're forced to take philosophy. You're forced to grapple with you know, computer science and math and, and logic. And, you know, and there's kind of this natural intersection of all these things. But I, I do think it's created uh, these incredibly uh, creative people that, that have been kind of behind the scenes of a lot of these tech companies. So I think you know, as these um, new tools change, there are probably a lot of these intersection points where you know, if, if we think about, and, and they've always existed. I think if we look at architecture, for example, I mean, architecture is aesthetics and mathematics uh, in some ways, right? So I think that there always have been these um, things that have sat at the crossroads. Uh, I was listening to a podcast on the train here this morning from, from New York about um, basically uh, being able to identify music based on the beats per minute. And it's inherently a math challenge to, to identify music. And so you think of, OK, music is a fuzzy subject, but not really. You know, it, Behind the scenes, it can be heavily mathematical as well. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't think that there's sort of one, one right answer, but I, I love that you're exploring that. Uh, over there in the corner. Yes, thanks. Um, Rob Colorina, AIAC Investment Group. Um, my question is uh, it's two, uh, two elements. One is, what was your uh, findings with respect to uh, larger families and siblings? Did you was there any competitive nature among siblings of going into either you know technology or liberal arts? And the second thing is, was there any influence on study abroad of type of experiences, um, you know, towards these paths? Interesting. Um, I don't really cover like study abroad per se. I mean, I think that we obviously live in an increasingly globalized world uh, where. You know, back to the question of, of, of education as, as well, this notion that um, you know, just learn the techie skill, become this, go through STEM, and you've got this carte blanche. I think if, if you look, if you're highly creative, and let's say you're in a place like systems engineering, or you're building the infrastructure as a techie, um, those jobs will always, I think, exist. But I think this notion that you, know, you uh, code websites, and that's going to be your bread and butter forever, um, there are quickly uh, places like Lagos, Nigeria, where Andela is a company uh, that's between New York and Lagos, and what they're doing is training people that are coming out of great universities in Nigeria, giving them all the skills to, say, do Ruby on Rails or front-end development, back-end development, bringing together whole teams that then they uh, outsource uh, projects from IBM and from Google and Microsoft, and all these big companies are hiring dev teams in Nigeria. And so you look at sort of, uh, you know, are rote coding skills becoming the new blue collar jobs? Those are the things that, you know, the same way that we had Wipro and Infosys and Tata Consulting Services and the business process outsourcing to India, um, you know, in the 90s and 2000s. Um, I think that we'll see some of that in the same way uh, for rote coding skills, and we're already seeing it. Um, my website, for example, for the book, uh, I had coded uh, for about $1,000 in Ukraine in under a week. Um, so there are examples of this all over the place. So I think you know, uh, understanding the world in the global context, study abroad, uh, hugely, hugely important. And then to your other question about uh, sibling rivalry, I guess. I don't know. Um, we had a funny interaction uh, as we were chatting just before this, I think, about uh, not knowing too much and sort of staying humble. Uh, so in the process of writing this book, um, you know, I came out as a, a tech kind of background in, uh, in Silicon Valley. And I knew nothing about writing books. And I just sort of iterated my way down this path and stumbled my way into having this uh, book on, on Stephen's lap. And at the same time, uh, my sister, who's a French and creative li uh, literature major, uh, who went to the Iowa Writers Workshop, is working on manuscripts. And in the process of me writing the book, she's helped to launch a fintech startup in Los Angeles. And so you know, kind of the not knowing too much uh, and sort of uh, I don't know if there's sibling rivalry, but uh, I don't know if that answers your question at all. But yeah, I think that uh, that gets to uh, 
uh, how many studies have been done that show that people, you know, people can have uh, very severe opinions about certain things, which then dis decline precipitously when they're actually exposed to the, the subject of their, uh, their opinion, whatever that might be. Um, I don't know if that applies to sibling rivalry, but uh, you know, pretty much in every single other case, I'm pretty sure it does. Uh, right there in the uh, tan blazer. Thank you very much. Fascinating conversation. Massimo Calabresi from Time Magazine. I wonder if you reached any conclusions in the book about the comparative advantage of firms that combine uh, the fuzzy and the techie, or whether uh, in a society that increasingly uh, places monetary value uh, above other values, whether it's in healthcare or information, uh, whether you found some inherent advantage that needed to be pushed back against for, say, technical uh, skills? So there's one example of blending the fuzzy and the techie that I think is really a poignant example is a company called Stitch Fix. Um, I don't know if anyone here is familiar with Stitch Fix, but they're effectively a Netflix for a subscription fashion. And so they take an item of clothing and they, they employ a bunch of stylists and they classify that piece of uh, fabric according to 100 or 150 characteristics. And then they pump that through a machine learning algorithm um, based on sort of you connect to your Pinterest board or you connect to your set of preferences. And then they try to predict, like Netflix does with movies, what you might like fashion-wise. And then they send you those items. You keep some, you send some back, and they iteratively get better and better. Um, so they've raised about $50 million uh, and are doing hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue uh, on this hybrid model. And so they're not uh, an only machine learning shop. What they do is they pass the machine learning, sort of the, the, what they call their M algorithm, to a set of humans, what they call their H algorithm. And the interesting thing is they've got about 70 data scientists that power the M algorithm, and they've got about 4,000 stylists that power the H algorithm. Wow. And what those humans do is the last mile delivery. And so they take and they contextualize all the information. So they have a subset of maybe 10 items of clothing that they think that you'll like. But then they know a little bit about the demography. They know a little bit about you from conversations. They know maybe where you are in the country. If you say that you're fashion forward, but you're in Lexington, Kentucky, is that different than if you're fashion forward <laughs> and you're in midtown Manhattan? You know, almost, they, they contextualize some of these uh, <laughs> notions. And so they've, they've done an incredible job of, I think, bridging the fuzzy and the techie um, in the sense that uh, Katrina Lake, the founder of the company, uh, is a fuzzy. Uh, she came out of, I mean, an economics and sort of business and social commerce background, fashion background. And she partnered with a guy named Eric Coulson, who ran a Netflix algorithms program. And he had built sort of the backbone of Netflix before going to Stitch Fix. And uh, to me, that's a really uh, great example of both on the job front, uh, you know, the 60 or 70 data scientists and the 4,000 humans that power the, the, the stylist engine, um, and then also on sort of the magic of, of bringing these two together. Um, and so, and Eric is a huge proponent of, of both sort of the, the M and the H algorithm. Um, and your second question was more about the pushback. The, the larger point of the question is, is whether or not um, uh, you think it's a sort of natural thing that will happen that liberal arts and technical skills will meld because the market favors that, or whether the market favors at the moment because of the structure of the market and because of the uh, valuation of uh, profit mm -hmm. over other values, uh, whether the technical gains an advantage over less monetizable skills, if you see what I'm saying. So I think, I think that's sort of the, the myth that I seek to, to bust through the book, is the fact that these are, mon you know, the, the high-performing companies are these tech monoliths, because they're not. You, know, you look at Snapchat, recent IPO. You know, what was the reason why Snapchat won this sort of Gen X, Gen Z, uh, uh, you know, demographic. Why didn't those people go to Instagram or Facebook? Um, one could argue that the major epiphany in what they had what was for people that grew up with digital abundance, people that had, you know, every photo they have ever taken stored in Dropbox on their Google phone and Google Cloud, um, they, they didn't know digital scarcity. And so it was actually a sociological insight of understanding that what could create demand was creating scarcity on the platform. And the way to create scarcity was make things disappear. And there's a guy named Nathan Jurgensen, uh, based in Brooklyn, 
who is a PhD sociologist that wrote all about uh, what he called digital dualism in this idea that, um, that things that were online could be real and things that are offline could be fake. And we have this idea that our real world is real and our online world is sort of somehow ethereal, ethereal and, and, and not tangible. And he said, you know, wait a minute, when you look at the stage dressing of Instagram posts and of your brunch table, um, that's sort of creating artifice in the real world and that's fake. And if you have this moment of a selfie that's on Snapchat, that can be very <coughs> authentic and very real. And so I actually think, you know, you look at Snapchat and what's made them super effective and, and high growth and really resonate with this demographic was actually this fuzzy insight. Um, and similarly, I think with Google Glass and with Snap Spectacles, there is this idea of, you know, indoor glasses and transparency or outdoor sunglasses and inherent sort of assumption of non-transparency. And to have a recording device on a sunglass, to me, makes a lot more sense than a recording device on clear glasses where you expect to have informal you know, conversation indoors, transparency. And so these are very small uh, nuances, but I think those are actually the reasons why products succeed or fail. And so I think you know, behind the scenes of these tech companies, um, the product decisions that uh, really make things work and find that product market fit, I think often have this uh, soft skill, often have this um, you know, fuzzy uh, in the room as well. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that th that's, th that's one of the uh, interesting points that I, I, I took away after reading the book was <clears throat> You know, from an international security perspective, and e indeed from a defense perspective, you know, a, a lot of these questions that Scott's talking about are actually what we refer to as concepts of employment. So, when you whether you have a technology or an idea or a strategy, you know, it's not as much to have the 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 capability to do something. It's more about how you would choose to to use that capability, or in some cases, like nuclear weapons, choose to not use mm -hmm. that capability. Um, and I think you get, to, you get to a lot of those questions. Um, I think even from an enterprise level, to your point, yeah, at a corporate level, in terms of fusing these uh, two concepts together, I think you get, you get that by bringing in uh, the fuzzy and the techie. Um, coincidentally enough, uh, I think if, uh, if Stitch Fix were to look at my outfit right now, they would <laughs> characterize it as wonky yet approachable. Um, <clears throat> any other questions? Great, uh, and we'll make this the last one. I'll give them that feedback. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> I'm Phil Loomis from Right Work Labs. And I'm going to a talk, uh, actually at an after hour happy hour next week, by NAVA. And NAVA's doing these to recruit. Uh, and I'm trying to tell them about what you're talking about with some success. The success I've had is telling them a story about Wirecutter, which is a magazine like Consumer Reports just got sold to New York Times, and about the founder who took WordPress and made basically a model of his company, 50 people. And it worked, and he loved it, and let, let him not do as much management. And you can imagine how something like this could be used, for example, your police uh, example. You could imagine how this would happen how you would have a model of a city and the police in it and who's doing what and who knows what and all this sort of thing. And it would be cheap because you're using WordPress. He, by the way, had a master WordPress person on board. So here's my question. Like I say, it's really slow going with them. Uh, and the reasons, I think, are you can figure out why it is. This is so foreign to these people who think of themselves as leaders in DC and civic tech. My question to you is really how do, and again, let me add one more thing. This is something where if we're going to do police departments, we're talking lots of people. So mid and low skill tech skills, but lots and lots of people. With these guys at NAVA being leaders, but right now this is completely beyond what they can see. So my question is, next week when I go and have a beer with these guys, what should I say? <laughs> well, in the, I'll give you an example of a, I th so I think if they really, so maybe I'll paraphrase your question. Um, if, if they really, you're saying they understand this domain of, uh, of civic tech and they're looking at applying WordPress to it or? 
No, uh, what, what NAVA does is they make things that are like uh, consumer tax software, and they work for people like the VA. So, you know, the VA's got zillions of things going on, and how can you use software to reduce the complexity and keep track of all this data with, and, and you know, this type of software you keep and you keep building it. Yeah. And this other type of software that we're talking about here, which is a next generation type of software. This is, it's a different type of software, different type of problem. And again, what you're trying to capture with your software in this case is all of these complex human interactions. And you're also presumably creating symbolic worlds which represent these very complex human circumstances. So that, you know, you're a junior cop, Mm -hmm. You can know what's going on in your, these seven blocks that you're assigned to. To them, this is an enormous leap. And it is a big leap. But again, I think it's very much next generation application and doable. There's a company that's uh, in this space, actually, that um, I feature a little bit in the book. It's called OpenGov. I don't know if you're familiar with OpenGov. But they, uh, a fascinating story of Zach Bookman, um, who worked for General H.R. McMaster in Afghanistan, studied public policy and law, and was really uh, fascinated by transparency. And so to your point of knowing sort of what's happening on a block-to-block -block basis, he was flying in Chinook helicopters across you know, dusty parts of Afghanistan, looking at transparency issues, and had the realization in a shipping container rather than in a garage, like is normally the case in Silicon Valley. Um, that we needed to focus on transparency here in the States. And so he, he is a fuzzy, but partnered with a uh, techie, uh, Joe Lonsdale, who co-founded Palantir. And they've built this platform that now has about 1,400 cities across the US, all the municipal uh, data for those cities, for you know, expenditures and revenues, and figuring out you know, on a block-by-block -block basis uh, you know, where are more parking tickets given out, or uh, you know, what, what's the timing of, of waste management services going through the city. And so they've tried to visualize, and they've partnered with 1,400 cities to take the data they have, the raw data, and then they've built the platform that, you know, rather than using WordPress or something else, um, they've tried to build the infrastructure and the pipes where for the people that, you know, understand the problems, understand the data, they can basically partner with OpenGov and then get the dashboard and get the display of that data um, to then provide the transparency to that junior cop. But that's, um, I don't know if that's an answer to your question, but that's, I think, a great example of, you know, how somebody who really uh, was passionate about transparency and passionate about this problem uh, was able to, you know, that became the comparative advantage of, of creating this, this company that's, you know, raised tens of millions of dollars and em employs hundreds of people and, and now has, you know, 1,400 cities uh, yeah. with better transparency than they've ever had before because it's not in boxes of uh, Excel printouts. It's actually in dashboards like, like Google Analytics where you can click on graphs and see you know, where uh, in real time uh, your city is functioning and where it can improve. Well, I think you see why, uh, <clears throat> why this book was the uh, finalist, right, for the uh, yeah. uh, Bracken Prize, uh, is that right? Yeah, uh, Bra Brackenbauer Prize. For, uh, I think, McKinsey and the, I also voted the, the, one of the Financial Times uh, Books of the Month for, uh, for April. Um, so. Uh, I think it's really exciting, Scott. And I'm, I, I, I almost wish that we had done this uh, discussion over a, over a, a bottle of you know something other than, than water. Uh, <laughs> it's really one of the more philosophical discussions I've had in, in a long time. Uh, please join me in uh, thanking uh, Scott for coming here today. Thank you.